Mate, what is happening this week? Welcome to episode 46 of the Exponential Performance Podcast. In this episode, we are going to be taking a look at the function pillar of the performance temple. Functional strength, what does that actually mean? How can you use it to maximize your performance? We also take a look at heart rate monitors. What is better? wrist-based heart rate monitors or using heart rate monitors with a chest strap. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Exponential Performance Podcast. Join sports scientist and performance coach Matty Graham to find out how to train smarter and maximize your performance no matter who you are. Mate, welcome to episode 46 of the Exponential Performance Podcast. I'm Maddie Graham, and it is so good to have you here with me. What has been happening this week? Personally, I've been getting back into some consistent training on the mountain bike after about six months of being off training due to working on some uh, rehab on some little niggly issues that have been ongoing. So I took some complete rest to get those right. I'm back, I'm about two weeks deep back into some consistent training and the body's holding up good and feeling good. Now just remember, if you have any questions that you would like me to answer on the podcast or topics you would like to see me dig into, cover, please send them through either via email, over on Facebook or Instagram or ideally head over to exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash ask and send through a voice question. That way I can play it on the podcast and answer it afterwards. But if you don't want to ask a voice question, I know some of you are a little nervous about that, just email it through to me. Happy to answer them for you. Now, just a reminder, if you are training for the Coast to Coast, the Kathmandu Coast to Coast, if you're training for that, Remember, you can get a free two-month training plan over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash C2C. That there is a free introduction to the online training system for the Coast to Coast. That includes a bunch of videos, training plans, and information so that you can prepare yourself for what is an extremely big challenge. Doesn't matter if you're a first timer, whether you're doing the one day, the two day, the team race, there are training plans for every possibility over there. Now before we crack into it, I have a question about heart rate monitors and power meters. If you remember back to episode 44, I talked about, is it essential to have a heart rate monitor? Is it essential to have a heart rate monitor? And someone asked over on YouTube in the comments section, what about power meters? Are power meters an essential training tool? And what I'd say to that is that, no, they're not essential. an essential training tool. You don't have to have a power meter to train effectively. And all of the same points for power meters apply, for heart rate monitors, sorry, apply to power meters. A power meter and a heart rate monitor are essentially the same thing apart from the obvious thing of power meter measuring power and heart rate measuring heart rate. What they are is a tool that measures work. Now a power meter directly measures work as in it measures the power that you're producing on a bike and a heart rate monitor indirectly measures work in that it measures your body's response to work and we assume that the response to work is consistent at least over the short term. So if you have a power meter that's all good but it's not necessarily going to make you any better unless you think of it in the same way that we talked about heart rate monitors in episode 44. You need to make sure that you've got your training zones dialed in because that's what a power meter is going to do. It's going to tell you how hard you're training uh, and then using those parameters you can change your training intensity based on your training goals. A power meter is also going to be really good for helping you track your progress, your training metrics through something such as training peaks, 
able to see how much training load you're actually experiencing. So is a power meter essential for training? The answer is no. Are they an extremely effective tool? Yes, only if you use them effectively. So moving on from power meters, let's have a look at the performance temple function pillar. Now we're moving our way through the performance temple pillars. We're on to our second one and that is function. Now if you haven't already checked out and got your free copy of the performance temple, you can get your free introductory guide over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com and this is what I am reading from today. So we're talking function. An athlete's function relates to their mechanical function, muscle balance, posture, and their ability to move and live as a normal human being. If you have poor posture, muscular imbalances, lower back pain, or do not have adequate core strength to stand properly, then as soon as you start training hard in complex movement patterns such as running, kayaking, cycling, and swimming, you will start to overload certain muscle groups, tendons and joints through poor movement patterns and become injured. You can improve your performance indirectly through functional strength training by developing your core stability. This leads to improvements in postural control, alignment and an increase in injury resilience, meaning that you're not going to get injured as easy. Numerous studies have been conducted investigating core strength development and performance. Core fatigue has been found to result in altered cycling mechanics that expose the knees to greater stress that can lead to injury, while core specific strength training over six weeks has been found to improve 5k running performance and allow athletes to train injury free more often. The core is the critical link that connects the two areas of major force generation, the pelvis and the shoulder girdle in the human body. When you look at the human skeleton, the spine is little more than a precariously stacked Jenga tower that the shoulder and the hips are hinged off. The only thing stabilizing the stack of vertebrae are the muscles, tendons and ligaments of the core. Like guide wires holding up a ship's mast or spokes in a bike wheel, if any of these guide wires or spokes are over tight or loose, then you'll end up with a mast that is on a lean or a wheel that doesn't spin true. Due to the repetitive nature of endurance sports and modern life in general, athletes often end up with tight overdeveloped muscle groups while others become weak and stretched out. This imbalance in the guide wire tension causes misalignment of your posture, which over time can lead to injuries through excessive loading of structures that are not designed to be loaded in such a way or direction. And in the performance temple introductory, there's a picture of the skeleton and the muscles and, and the core and then a wee diagram about which muscles get tight in endurance athletes, so you can check that out. Back to the performance temple. Being able to generate force using the large muscles of the lower body and then transferring this force into the upper body, such as in kayaking, or preventing force dissipation from the lower body mechanics, such as in running and cycling, are all the responsibility of the core. Because of the large number of muscles and joints involved in the core, the coordination of the stabilization and force transfer can be hard to master. This is exacerbated with traditional, in quotation marks, core training as some of the large muscle groups of the core become overdeveloped and the smaller stabilizer muscles become even more inactive. The development of an athlete's core should be the primary focus of for athletes of all ability. In figure three, 
you can see a classic example of a cyclist's imbalance in the shoulder and hip girdle. Spending large amounts of time riding and also running and kayaking and sitting at a desk, all those sort of things. Cause the muscles highlighted in red, the pectorials, the hip flexors and the erector muscles of the spine to come, become very strong and tight. These then pull on the shoulders rounding the spine and tilt the pelvis forward. The weak slash stretched out muscles of the upper back, abdominals, glutes and hamstrings are not able to counteract this constant tension and it is often these areas in which injuries or tightness is felt, i.e. sore shoulders slash back or tight hamstrings. And there's a weak diagram about that so you can see that. These imbalances are exacerbated during day-to-day -day living in the modern world through prolonged sitting, computer work and driving. This further rounds the shoulders, tightens the hip flexors and weakens the abdominals. If an athlete is unable to perform the relatively simple task of maintaining correct posture, then they're going to struggle in the long term to perform optimally on the bike, in the pool, running or paddling, not to mention their ability to live a long, pain-free life outside of training. At the moment, mobility is all the craze. Mobility incorporates the use of stretching, foam rolling and other methods to keep your body in alignment so that you can move properly, keep your body in one piece and get that peak performance you are after. One of the best resources in mobility I can recommend is Becoming a Supple Leopard, written by Dr. Kelly Starrett, which will become your movement bible. And there's a link in the performance temple that takes you to that. So what the function pillar is all about in the performance temple is looking after your body, getting the basics done. I'm not talking about strength training. I'm not talking about training in the gym to improve your performance out on the bike. All I'm talking about is training in a way to cover the baseline fundamental movements and structure and function of the human body. Getting this down first before you start building anything on top of it. So the function pillar is one that I often see so many cracks in with athletes. Big cracks that are often held together with band-aids or painkillers. And this is because endurance athletes don't often like taking care of their body. They'd rather be out there doing their sport. And I'm guilty of this myself. And this is why I've had to take six months off the bike to work on my own function pillar. Because my function pillar kept crumbling and the house kept falling down on top of me. So what I did is took six months off, not saying that you need to do that, and really focused on my function. I was working in the gym, I was working on my mobility, I was working with a physio and a massage therapist to work on getting my body right. Because it's something I've personally neglected for a long time. So it's kind of interesting that we're talking about it now. So with the function pillar, it does take a little bit of work and it does depend on who you are. Some people are going to have different tightnesses, different weak areas to other people. However, in saying that, Endurance athletes inherently have the same problems reoccurring no matter who they are, nine times out of ten. So what I've done is I've put together a specific functional strength training plan, easy session that you can do, that targets the key areas uh, that have, have been outlined in the function introduction. So you can get the Performance Temple Handbook the extended handbook with this strength session in it. Normally these are priced at $7. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reduce the price of these to $1. Just so that everyone, whoever wants it, can get it to hopefully help them as much as I can. $1. So one, $1 for the function handbook, it comes with that strength session in there. If you wanna get the nutrition, 
the function, the psychology, and the recovery handbook, all four of them, usually that sells for $18. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reduce all handbooks over the next month for $1. So you can get all of them for $4, okay? So if you want to do that, you can head over to exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash PT package, as in performance temple package. And, the, and you can click through, get them all over there. Alternatively, a link is all going to be provided over exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash 46 for episode 46. So that is the function pillar. I would imagine that many of you out there could spend some time invested into your function pillar and it would go a long, long way. So have a think. Comment below. How is your function pillar looking at the moment? Is it held together with band-aids and painkillers? Is it something that gives out on you in longer races? Because that's often what happens, is you can often get by on short races without too many issues, but as soon as you start doing long ultra-endurance or endurance events, often that's what will happen. People start to get really sore pains in their lower back, or their knees become a trouble. If that sounds like you, and your body is the thing that is restricting your fitness or performance, then you need to take a look at your function pillar. Let's move on to a question I have about heart rate monitors. Is it better to have a wrist-based heart rate monitor or a chest strap heart rate monitor? So, a lot, of, a lot more heart rate monitors are coming out now that have got a wrist reading function on them. So you don't even need a chest strap anymore. You just put it on your wrist and it measures using a little infrared light. It measures your pulse rate or your heart rate. Now, let's just have a look at this because which one is better? Mm, it's always hard to say, yes, this one is better. But let's have a look at some of the pros and cons and have a think about what you're looking for in a heart rate monitor and that may change which road you head down. So chest versus wrist base. So let's start with the chest because this is the old the old dog so to speak. It's been around for a long long time. So with a chest strap what is actually happening is that your the strap is measuring the electrical signal from your heart. Okay, and that's why it needs to be wet, because obviously water conducts electricity. So if you put a, a dry heart rate strap on, often you'll get wonky readings or there won't be any reading at all. If you put some water on it, or you spit on it, if you're an animal, then you're going to get a signal. So it's measuring the direct electrical signal from your heart, just like an ECG, like you get put on when you're in, when you're in hospital, they stick those sticky things to your chest hook them up with some wires, they're measuring the electrical signal from your heart. So what are some of the pros, the pros, the positive things from a chest strap? Well, it's more accurate, okay? It's more accurate at low intensities and also, interestingly, at higher intensities compared to that wrist-mounted heart rate monitor. They are very reliable. They are very reliable and there's less lag in the response time. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about the wrist base, but if you can imagine it's measuring straight from your heart, what's happening in your heart, the electrical activity, as soon as that increases, you see an increase on your monitor. Not so much when it's measured at your wrist, but we'll talk about that a little bit. So, these here are sort of the standard in sports science. If you were doing any sort of research in the sports science field, you're either going to be using one of these chest straps or you're going to be using an, 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 a medical grade ECG depending on if you're just looking at the actual number of heartbeats or whether you're looking at actually the waveform of the, of the heart. So they are really reliable. And this would be my first number one stop. What are some of the cons when it comes to the chest base? Some people complain of comfort. Some people complain of comfort. 
having that strap on there can rub, can be a little bit uncomfortable. Fair call. Maintenance. Now, I think it was way back, maybe episode one or episode two, I talked about problems that I have encountered through myself and also with the athletes that I work with about Garmin heart rate straps and them becoming old, maybe dirty, uh, low battery maybe, not clean enough and not giving good signals. So there is a maintenance issue and to, ha to get a good reading out of the heart rate straps you need to make sure that they're kept clean, dry, maintained well, that sort of thing because it sort of seems that there can be a few issues around them. The final one is not really a fault of the uh, of the heart rate strap itself, but it happens sometimes. It happens sometimes. People forget. They chuck their heart rate monitor in the bag, but not the heart rate strap. So they get out there, they've got their watch, but they don't have the strap to go with it. Unfortunately, no heart rate for you today. Which is kind of a pain when you're trying to get the training data to upload to Training Peaks to man manage in your training load can be a pain to have to remember two things to take with you. So while the chest strap is definitely more accurate and reliable, there are some drawbacks when it comes to it in terms of comfort, potentially maintenance, uh, and, the, and getting good readings depending on the maintenance of the heart rate strap, and then just plain old forgetting it. So what about these newfangled wrist heart rate monitors. Now, so how are these actually measuring heart rate? Well, on the back of the watch, or the monitor, you'll see uh, a little red or green light, usually. And this little LED light measures blood, throw, blood flow through the arteries in your wrist. Now, if you've ever been to hospital and had one of those little things put on the end of your finger, that measures your pulse and your uh, blood oxygen levels. It's the same concept as those. It's measuring your pulse down at your wrist. If you put your fingers on your wrist and palpate or push on the outside aspect as you rotate your hand over to face you, you better feel your pulse. So you can feel your pulse. That is what your watch is measuring at your wrist. The little light shines down uh, and, and disturbances in the light is due to the flow of blood through these vessels. So what are some of the pros of these wrist mounted units? They're very convenient, okay? We just talked about losing or forgetting your heart rate strap. If you've got your watch, you've obviously got your heart rate monitor as well. You put it on, you're away to go. The comfort thing is also there. You don't have to have a chest strap around your chest. There's no rubbing, aggravation. I know some people can get sort of eczema -y, pimply sort of symptoms going on from heart rate straps when they're training a lot. And they are quite accurate at low to moderate intensities compared to the chest straps. Usually about one to three beats different. Okay, so let's say they're the same at low to moderate intensities as the chest strap. What are some cons with these wrist-based units? Because they seem to be shaping up pretty well. At higher intensities, they're quite inaccurate, okay? And somewhere between sort of five to 20 beats per minute at higher intensities, which is quite a lot, which is quite a lot. And if you're looking at getting good heart rate data to track training loads, or you're monitoring your training intensity, which I hope you are, then these probably aren't the best units to be using uh, at higher intensities. The placement of the watch on your wrist affects the reliability. So it's really important that they are placed on your wrist, wrist correctly and also tightly. Because if it's not placed on there tightly, then it can move. And remember that little light is picking up movement or disruptions in constant 
non-movement, so to speak. So it's important that it's tight on there so we don't get too much uh, outside noise coming in, if you like. Further to that, how tense your forearm is in the watch strap also can have an effect. So if you're squeezing anything, such as a weight, a handlebar, a paddle, that sort of thing, if you're squeezing and there's changes in forearm tension, then that can again go back to that changing of the placement or the that change of movement around the sensor and affect the reliability. So as you can see, there's pros and cons with each the wrist and also the chest mounted. So what I'd say is if you're primarily looking for accuracy and getting some good quality training data, I don't think you can go past the chest strap as long as you can remember it and keep it clean and as long as comfort's not an issue for you. If you're looking for something that's a little more convenient, maybe you're not too worried about the quality of the data that you're getting from it. You just you want it for a general rough estimate uh, or you're not sticking solidly to just pure heart rate training zones, maybe you're using power, maybe you're using RPE or how hard you feel you're, you're working, then maybe the wrist strap or the wrist monitor is you know good or beneficial to you. So I hope that just clears up a few uh, questions around wrist versus strap measurement. Let me know what kind of heart rate monitor do you have? What do you like about it and what do you not like about it? Comment in the comment section below. Now I am very aware of time because I have had some comments that the episodes have been running longer than normal. They've been running longer than normal as I've been digging into this performance temple uh, content. So we're going to start wrapping things up here today. Uh, with the idea of keeping these episodes around 30 minutes. With that in mind, the people listening to these podcasts may have changed slightly since we originally decided on the shorter time frame. So how long is optimal for these podcasts? How long do you want to see the Exponential Performance Podcast? Is around the 20 to 30 minutes good? Do you get the information that you're after in a time-effective uh, no BS sort of way. We don't want to chuck in all these fillers just to fill up a podcast. Or would you like to see more content? Longer podcasts around the 45 minutes, potentially through to an hour. Again, while you're filling out a comment around what uh, heart rate monitor strap you are using, flick a comment down there about what length would you like the podcast at. It would be greatly appreciated. Now for any of the resources I've mentioned on today's podcast you can check them over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash 46 for episode 46. Remember if you've got any questions at all let me know. If you're happy to have them answered on the podcast or in a video send them on through, send me an email, post them on Facebook, Instagram, or head over to exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash ask and leave me a voice question. It would be greatly appreciated. If you want your question asked in a more private manner, my answer just through to you, head over to my Reach Me account where you can ask me a private question and I will send you through a private answer. There's a small fee to help cover my time answering these questions over there. Remember, no matter what platform you are listening on, remember to subscribe so you stay up to date with everything that I've got coming out, or come on over to Facebook or Instagram to continue the conversation over there. Ask me questions, check out the other things that I post over there. Until next week, get out there, train hard, but most importantly, train smart.